Great, thank you very much, and it's good to be here. And what I hope to do is um, represent our audience well at, from CEFS. i just make sure. All right, so CEFS stands for the Center for Environmental Farming Systems, and it is a three-way uh, partnership between North Carolina State University, North Carolina A&T University, and the North Carolina Department of Agriculture. And this is um, a slide that just came from a recent uh, brainstorming session that shows the road of CEFs, the history of where we've been and the, where we hope to go. And in the next uh, few minutes, I hope to dance along this road with you and highlight um, some of our environmental impacts and assessments as well as the sociological and social um, contributions. And you can see there's a lot of things, and I won't cover them all. <laughs> um, but I wanted to highlight what our mission is, and it says there to develop and promote uh, food and farming systems that protect the environment, strengthen local communities, and provide economic opportunities in North Carolina. And of course, you know, think locally, but I mean, act, think globally, but act locally. So we think about uh, going beyond. And there's been quite a number of excellent participants along the whole way, including support from private and public organizations that have made this process as, in, as enjoyable as it has been. And what I want to talk about, you know, as we dance, I want to dance between practice and science. And one thing I've really enjoyed about working with the organic community is that there's this high engagement with on-farm research and participatory ways of addressing issues. And i just give an example here. You know, if we just think about crop rotation, the Greeks and Romans did it many, many years ago. And it wasn't until we understood germ theory that we started understanding some of the mechanisms of how plant pathogens impact uh, rotation systems and also uh, fertility management. So what I'm going to try and highlight is that the practice can inform the science to come up with the scientific questions, but then in turn, in an engaged university or an engaged group of people, we then understand how that science then reinforms the practice to advance a sustainability. Um, the CEFS has actually a 2,000 acre farm which has many different types of farming systems experiments on it. Uh, we also have a small farm unit and the whole farm acts as a demonstration unit to engage people in uh, agents, growers, students through internships and stuff like that, uh, especially young people and also um, have initiated an agroecology program uh, on the campus and through the universities. Um, North Carolina, the state, uh, through legislature, initiated a food policy council to enhance local food production and sustainability. And um, also, um, there's a lot of work in farm to fork initiatives to engage all of the citizens in North Carolina in local food production and consumption. Uh, so in this road, I'm mostly going to focus at the far left uh, on the farming systems. And this is where the practice and science came together. So as we were developing plans, and some of this started before I arrived. I arrived in 96. You can see that some of the plans started as early as um, 1990. Um, but um, when we started forming these farming systems experiments, uh, the local agricultural community was highly engaged, especially for the organic farming systems. There's a high dependence on the practice of organic farmer to then engage what the next scientific question should be. And then hopefully, you know, and it has been, you know, that circle is made complete where the science reinforms the practitioners. Uh, and I'm going to focus on our farming systems experiment, and this has been primarily led uh, by Paul Mueller initially. And the overall CES program, we have two directors, John O'Sullivan and Nancy Creamer. They have been great leaders for us and we really enjoy their leadership and vision. Um, well, you can see the number of different farming systems, uh, pasture-based dairy systems, pasture-based beef, uh, have um, hog operations, alternative swine production systems. We have a small farm system that really tries to uh, put the practices into farming, a complete farming system, like a model system, but that's, that's where we really engage our internships, our interns and, and students. Um, Chris Rebrick horton has recently come on board, and is very involved with organic grain research. And I'm mostly going to talk about farming systems work um, at the CES experiment. Now, uh, you know, when you have a plan and you make a plan, it doesn't always work out as you intend. And uh, this is a slide. If you're wondering what my background is, this is our farming systems experiment. This is the Noose River. 
1996, we had the 100-year um, flood. Uh, and in 1998, we had the 500-year flood. <laughs> so we are good for another 1,000 years, we figured. <laughs> but you can see the amount of flooding that occurred. And, um, but we took that opportunity. We got a lot of great data sets of how different farming systems were impacted by that flood. Um, in North Carolina, especially East North Carolina, um, there's a high amount of variability in the soil types and soil classification. And that's what these colors represent. And so we did intensive soil mapping. And then we put these five different farming system experiments um, according to the soil maps. We blocked the replications. And I'm just going to highlight what those systems are. Um, starting at number five is our cash grain system, our best management practices. So this would represent what most of the growers in eastern North Carolina do. Um, annual crops, short rotation systems, fairly intensive. And we we've, we've have split plots into conventional tillage and no tillage systems. Then we have an integrated crop animal system, so like a 15-year rotation of animals, pasture, and uh, cropping systems, which are parallel to the best management practices. Then we have the organic production systems, um, and then those are split into four subplots, asking different questions that our organic growers had. And then finally, we have a plantation forestry. We felt like there's more opportunity for landscape diversity in North Carolina. And we have what we call a negative control. After 1998, all that 81 acres was planted to rye, and then the successional land was allowed to just go through natural succession. And it's just been great to watch the species diversity over time in that system. And we use that as a negative control. If we didn't farm, what would happen? Um, so here you can see how we have mapped, and then these white lines represent our diagnostic soils. And so we put GPS, um, the, the red dots are where our sampling points are. These are GPS. Um, sites where we constantly take um, our soil parameters and, and key indicators of what we want to be measuring. And you can see how we uh, put the three replications, the five farming systems. In fact, Rep B, you see we had the split because we blocked it according to soil type. And so uh, to, to at least try to minimize the high level of variability we have in our farming systems in that part of North Carolina. And in fact, for the whole eastern coastal plain. Um, we also have nested it within that large farming systems, which was initially SAIR funded, what, what we call an NRI, an IFAS funded project, where we looked at the transition. If you're going to go to organics, how are you going to transition? And uh, I won't be able to discuss that today, but we had a similar design. We had six transitional experiments there and comparing those transitional experiments. And then again, we have an intensive soil sampling, all GPS mapped. Um, the way we do that, we would work as a team. We would sample the soils, and that's what this slide is showing, how we sample the soils, we pool that soils, we homogenize that soils, and then each discipline would then analyze that soil. So we're all analyzing of the same pool of soil. So we look for carbon content, microbial community analysis, nematode community analysis, et cetera, uh, from those soil samples. And then a lot of those soils have been archived over time. And just an idea of the type of parameters that were measured, uh, you can see all kinds of soil parameters um, and biological parameters, chemical, physical, soil parameters, and then, of course, yield and economic outputs um, we've been able to measure over time. Um, this just shows you, um, this is the, from the paper I'm going to highlight, but just shows you the type of crops we're growing. So in the best management practices, conventional tillage, no tillage, you see we have the short rotation crops, typical of eastern North Carolina. In the organic system, we put more specialty crops in, like sweet potatoes and cabbage, uh, to try and capture that more of that premium dollar in some of those systems. And then, of course, in the uh, forestry systems, we have different types of tree species. Um, black walnut uh, was one that we highlighted here. And then, of course, the successional is the abandoned field. These are just some slides. If you look at the top right, and for our webinar people, and you move counterclockwise, we have sweet potatoes and organics, peanuts in a uh, conventional tillage system. Then we have some cattle, and underneath that, a cropping system in that crop animal system. And then to the right, you can see the successional system and how it's maturing. It's, uh, it's probably in its preteen years. And then um, you can see the forestry system, and that's, that's also slightly managed. Um, so in, as we accumulate data, and I'm only going to highlight a few things in terms of environmental impact and the type of data we're measuring, but this is a slide that Sui Jin Hu provided, uh, the faculty in plant pathology and microbial ecologist. Um, 
But if you look at the red line, you can see the carbon, uh, the total carbon content in the soil using conventional tillage is flatlined over, this is over uh, 10 years of data now. Um, and then you can see is with no-till, as you might expect, that over time we see this accumulation of carbon content, especially, of course, in the upper fraction of the soil. With the organic system, where we have high inputs of cover crops and compost, you can see we get this rapid increase in carbon content in the soils, and then it flatlines. And so that flatline, you know, that's a, we were concerned about that flatline, right? So it kind of gets to the session before. Is that a production issue? And then we can change our management practices? Or is that an issue of the inherent limitations of our soil and our soiling system? So, um, so to get at that, um, you know, we have some data to look at uh, you know, soil indicators. And so in this case, aggregate stability. You see no-till crop animal systems that have good aggregate stability compared to our conventional system and our organic systems are intermediate. And of course, that's because even though we have all those carbon inputs, we're constantly tilling that soil. And so uh, Chris Reborg is really trying to address this in his research, especially with the grain farmers. And this is in eastern North Carolina where we have a grain farmer using no-till conventional practices and then um, uh, in corn, and you can see where he's using tillage as a weed control mechanism, the amount of environmental damage you can get just from wind-blown sand on those uh, soils. And so um, Chris has put some numbers, you know, to the amount of energy it takes for weed management. And just to show that, you know, if you have no-till, Roundup-ready uh, systems, uh, the amount of energy it takes compared to conventional tillage, and then organic tillage, and you can see it's just mainly due to the um, extra tillage practices that are required for weed management. And so, um, you know, the question is, can we reduce the tillage? Can we uh, reduce the energy inputs? And of course, this is not a total life cycle analysis. If you look at fertility um, in conventional systems, there's a lot of energy that goes into uh, the synthetic fertilizers that are used in the system. Uh, so this is not a complete budget, of course. Uh, but, you know, so we're just having this hypothesis, you know, and working with our growers. Uh, and, and, you know, Chris is addressing the question, can we have rotational tillage? And so, like in this organic system, are we flatlined here because of excess tillage? Um, and can we incorporate more uh, carbon into the soil profile? Um, let's say here with the no-till also, uh, are we just accumulating carbon at the top? Or can we include rotational tillage to include carbon in that soil profile? and then also to get good weed suppression and look at pest management complex, co complexes and um, uh, crop productivity. And so again, linking that practice and the science uh, and then hopefully we can deliver that to, back to our growers. I mostly work in specialty crops, you know, and we're trying to address this with specialty crop growers also. Um, CES has been really great. You know, the dream was if you build it, they will come and it's generated over $23 million in projects. And I just put a few here, especially for our webinar audience that can take time to read it. Um, I'm going to highlight two studies that were funded. And one is this one that really looks at environmental impact risks and looking at um, uh, a number of parameters that we can measure. So hopefully have parameters that are measurable, that can change, especially in response to human activity, and um, that you can manage in terms of farming systems and environmental risk assessment and sustainable uh, systems. But just a couple highlights. You might look at pH in the middle here, and you see that the forestry and the successional systems, the pH goes down considerably, whereas in our managed systems, we can keep that up higher. Um, an interesting thing is the total phosphorus, say, in our organic systems, we have high phosphorus content because we use manures, we need the nitrogen, and we get the free ride of the excess phosphorus. So, you know, that's an, an issue that might need to be looked at, um, you know, in our systems there. Not too many differences there in soil quality impacts. Um, we also looked at uh, total fertility that's used in farming systems, uh, the nitrogen and phosphorus, and then these were all put into a scale of zero to one, uh, normalized, where one is good and zero would be high environmental risk and impact. And you'll see how that all comes together. Uh, same with tillage, this is another indicator of sustainability. Uh, we talked about high tillage intensity in organic system versus our other systems. Um, so this comes together all into these web graphs. And just for, we have the best management, conventional tillage, no tillage, the organic system, crop animal, the forestry system, and the successional system. And you can see the soil quality indicators are all very similar to one another, 
all close to one, good soil quality in terms of their indicators. Um, of course, in our forestry system, in our successional system, we have no pesticides, so they have no environmental impact there. But you can see how with the different systems, we have more environmental impact. Um, looking at tillage, again, in our successional system, there's no tillage, so that has a rating of one. But you can see in our organic system, we have a lot of tillage, so it has a very low rating in terms of environmental impact. And you can see the difference between no-till and convention till. And the goal is, is that, you know, using these indicators and web graphs, you can see the differential uh, ability of these farming systems to manage uh, ecosystem services and limit eco eco uh, ecosystem and environmental impacts. And these slides just show uh, them all together. We have our organic system, soil quality is all very similar. Um, but then the tillage, we have more tillage uh, risk with the organic systems, uh, sorry, in the purple. Um, and then low pesticide use. So just comparing those systems in terms of their environmental impact. Um, we also asked a question in terms of the second study, um, you know, what will future farming systems look like? What role will microbial communities play in those farming systems? And can we manage those microbial communities for pest suppressive and plant health benefits? So those are a series, that, those are a bunch of questions for a career, isn't it? And so it's a, great, it's a great series of questions that we'd like to ask. And, you know, I think some of the technologies that are emerging, uh, we use microarrays with Joe Zhu in um, Oklahoma State University, where we look at functional genes in these different farming systems. So we can look at the farming systems and ask, what are the functional genes present in terms of carbon cycling and nitrogen cycling? And what are the phylogenetically diverse organisms in those systems? And so we can start looking at changes in the microbial communities and then how do our management systems impact that? And then ultimately, can we manage those microbial communities for specific and in predictive ways? Um, so just to make a long story short, I was very encouraged by this type of data. Uh, first of all, if we do multivariate analysis and we look at the microbial community and how it's impacted, we can find key indicators, um, say pH. We saw how P successional really drives the pH down. And in conventional tillage, we have a higher pH, so there's key indicators that seem to impact the functional groups that are in those soils. And then if we look at those soils and we think about, well, what are the chemical impacts of the soils, the physical impacts, or what's the impact of distance uh, in terms of centimeters and meters? And what I was encouraged about, we could look at those microbial communities and partition the impacts of these different parameters, but there's not a lot of interaction, not as much as I thought there might be, which I was encouraged by, because if there was all kinds of interactions, we'd have no hope of understanding these microbial communities and managing them. And so this just partitions the variability in the microbial community structure into these different components, um, which I think is really informative. But we haven't totally digested it at all, uh, and we're still working on that. Uh, finally, you know, I just want to dance through how some of these um, research outcomes then impact our education and extension programs, we do a lot of agent training, internship programs, uh, training of the public um, through um, our work at SES and elsewhere. Um, and if we, you know, if we dance along our road, uh, we have featured speakers um, that have been able to participate in the SES mission. And then um, this Farm to Fork initiative is an initiative where we're trying to get uh, people to buy 10% of the food in North Carolina. And I just wanted to highlight that, that initiative. Uh, Nancy Creamer has just been a great leader in the state for that, uh, where she brought uh, multiple people together and came up with a farm to fork report, um, but then translated that into um, helping people think through what it means to buy locally. And if you spent 10% of your food, that would keep $3.5 billion in North Carolina. And then how does that help communities? How does that help farmers? Um, and so there's been a major partnerships that have signed on to that. And you see we have uh, some guests here, the Under Secretary of Agriculture there with our Chancellor in, in uh, North Carolina State University. Uh, and then finally, I just want to dance through how different faculty, and I'll just take our example, have used this practice and science together. Uh, we've done a lot of work at CESS with high tunnels and with Mary Peach, and uh, looking at grafting. Uh, we've engaged growers, you know, Alex Hitt and Ken Dawson and Stephen Hartman, uh, in this practice and science process to solve problems that they've encountered in organic production systems. And just one data set, if um, here you can see a tomato wilting from bacterial wilt, southern bacterial wilt, here's a field with severe problems. And if you don't graft, you have 100% plant death. And if you do have the right rootstock, you have 100% plant stand. 
And so, you know, this practice and science and integrating the two, you know, keeps the dance lively in our uh, SAF systems. And so we can see the ecological, environmental, and social impacts of that. Thank you.